crack open a tepid Genesee, watch the pictures as they travel through your neighbor's Wi-Fi. It's the Rees Company. I'm the bull of American broadcasting alongside the great Chris Morganti. And we're very excited to be coming at you, as they say on this platform, with another video. Of course you are. It's a video platform. What do you think is, what do you think we've uploaded? All right. Well, uh, anyway, Chris, um, how are you? I'm good. Excited about this one? Yeah. You chose this week's movie of the week of the week. I chose it knowing absolutely nothing about it. Mm -hmm. um, I saw Gwyneth Paltrow's name on it, and I thought, well, she's good, so let's give that a try. Okay, so why don't we just dive right into this. Uh, let's hit the intro for the movie of the week of the week. <laughs> This week's movie of the week of the week, Deadly Relations. It aired on the ABC television network on May 22nd, 1993. Like a lot of these movies, uh, last week of sweeps. Yeah. Original air date. And there is a, uh, there's a Lifetime Channel watermark on the videos that we uh, have to show, but I believe it was shown on the Lifetime network after it aired on uh, network television. Yeah, probably long after because yeah. there are promos, uh, kind of crawls for uh, How I Met Your Mother reruns. Okay. So, uh, yeah, this definitely re-aired on Lifetime many years hence. Um, and as you mentioned, it features Gwyneth Paltrow, who's still five years from her Oscar-winning performance in Shakespeare in Love. Hmm. It also stars Robert Urich. Star of uh, Vegas. Wait, I'm sorry. She won an Oscar for that? She did. Wow. Okay. I did not know that. Now, before the show, we were talking about Robert Urich, and uh, you mentioned you did not recall Vegas. No. What is that a we movie? We were very young when that was on. It was a TV show? or Yeah, it was a cop show, and uh, it took place in Nevada. Okay. And um, later on, uh, Spencer for Hire. That I've heard of. He was well known for starring in. Yeah. And... Um, also, so many TV movies of the 1990s Robert Urich was in. We should probably be awarding one to five Robert Ureks to some aspect of these productions. Yeah. Well, Deadly Relations, the TV movie, is based on the book Deadly Relations, the true story of murder in a suburban family. Yeah. Uh, the book was written now, by... Now that, now you mention that, Steve. Yeah. Uh, I actually have... Uh, there were quite a few interesting comments... Uh, YouTube on this YouTube video that we watched. And uh, you mentioned this being a true story. And uh, it's actually the very beginning of the movie has a, uh, has a, a, a statement that says, uh, this is based on a true story, more or less. In, uh, in other words, it says that. Right. And it uh, looks like I forgot to crop that one, but we'll have to fix that. Um, but then somebody posted... Uh, Asking, Jim, if you can pull up true story there. Uh, I wonder if it's based on true life accounts, which is almost exactly what that previous shot said, based on true life accounts. So there's a lot of these type of comments where people just, I, th I think they're commenting rather than watching the movie. Yeah, they're not paying any attention. It's the exactly. first thing you see when you watch this movie. Yeah. Is that note about it being based on a true story. Yeah. And then we get into a... a a long intro. I timed it, Steve. You could easily skip the first two and a half minutes of this movie. And uh, somebody commented on that. Jim, if you could bring up credits. Um, yeah, please. Now, you could be excused for thinking this is gibberish. Please, please don't take too much time to reveal all the cast before even watching the movie. It gets boring. They're talking about this first two and a half minutes, which you could completely ignore and miss absolutely nothing. Right. But, uh, but it, those are also opening credits. It's pretty standard for any production. It is, but it annoys me when they don't. You can show the credits over something interesting, something you could start the movie and it's, still it's show the credits. It's a black screen with white text. I don't like a movie where you have to watch minutes of credits. But that just like, you know, there'll be like a, like a, a shot of a, uh, you know, like a camera from a plane flying over a landscape or something, or like in the just clouds or something. Like you see this sometimes. It's like, what, why? Like it seems creatively um, deficient. Now, is this going to uh, affect your rating? No, but it does. The movie 
does not get off to a good start because of this. Okay. Yeah. And it's slow starting to begin with. But, uh, all right, enough of the comments for now. Let's get into uh, the movie. Okay, uh, it's based on the book Deadly Relations, and the book was written by two of the daughters who were portrayed in the film. Okay. Um, yeah, let's just dive right into the movie itself. Um, Len, that's Robert Urich. He's ex-military. Yeah. He has a wife, he has four daughters, and he runs a very tight household. Here's an example. Hey, let's go. Inspections, everybody in the rooms. On the double. March to it. It's clean enough, Carolee. But it's ready for another coat of wax. Yes, Danny. I'm not going to find any miniskirts in here, am I? If I find any miniskirts, I'll cancel your charge plates. Oh, no, I'd never wear one of those. And those young girls today wearing short skirts and makeup looking like sluts. Girls are blessed with natural beauty. You don't need any of that trash. Yes, Daddy. You're next, Nancy. Yeah, I mean, you, in the beginning, you think this is going to be, especially seeing the lifetime thing there, you would think this is just going to be about a strict father. Boy, is that not what this is about. <laughs> well, it's worth mentioning, uh, we saw her there as the scene closed. It's worth mentioning that the mother of the family is, uh, her name is Shirley. Yeah. And she's portrayed by three-time Elvis co-star Shelley Fabre. Okay. And uh, other things as well. Uh, she was uh, the wife and coach, Craig T. Nelson's wife. Okay. In the sitcom Coach. And she also played, um, uh, not played, she had a hit single, uh, He's a Rebel, in I think the early 60s. Oh, wow. So uh, a notable person in her own right. Yeah. Um, now, this house they live in, it's built on a huge Louisiana property. Now, in a voiceover at the top, Carol, she's the one played uh, by Gwyneth Paltrow, she explains that her father bought the property to build a family compound. And uh, I'll quote the narration. As each of his daughters married... She and her husband would be given a house next door. The family would grow bigger, but it would never grow apart. Yeah. And that was his plan for his land and for his family. Yeah. And this film wastes no time getting us there. It might have wasted some time with the credits, but as far as a daughter getting married, happens almost immediately. Joanne, she's Len's eldest daughter. Uh, she gets engaged to her boyfriend. Uh, buckle your seatbelts for two reasons now, as we watch how Len reacts to their announcement. It's getting late. Time for George to go. We'll speak about this another day. Yes, sir. I'll call you tomorrow. Okay. Are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? You're 19 years old. You decide to throw your entire life away? Daddy, I love George. Joanne, I want you to marry a professional man, a man with a future, after you finish college. Yes, uh, so Joanne's fiancé, George, right. as you've just seen, is played by... Chandler. Yeah. Also, Matthew Perry, known as. Uh, mere months from the debut of Chandler being in the sitcom Friends. Um, George no, and Joanne... That yeah. can't be right. Yeah. This was in the spring. Friends oh. debuted in that very fall. Of 93? 93, yes. No, nah, I don't think that's right, man. Okay, well, I only did research for this, but okay, Chris, whatever. We'll just agree to disagree. I think we need to double-check that. Because, I don't think uh, we need to. Okay. So uh, George and Joanne move into a newly built um, house on the family property. They also live on an allowance provided by Lynn, who is also paying their bills. Yeah. Kind of creates an awkward situation. Yeah, I would say that's awkward. Yeah. So not long after they settled. All right, we have the Friends Wikipedia page okay, up now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jim, and do you see uh, 19, airing date of a pilot episode? Uh, 1994. Yeah, exactly. I stand corrected. Yeah. I apologize. Uh huh. Sometimes the bull makes a mistake. Mm -hmm. This is going to linger a while, isn't it? <laughs> you came kind of hard at me the last couple times we had a disagreement. Okay. And, well, uh, so, yeah, I'm going to savor this one. Let the audience decide. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So not long after uh, George and Joanne settle in, Carol, Gwyneth Paltrow. Okay. She comes home with an announcement of her own. She's been away at college. Yes. Daddy? 
This is Bruce Applegarth. He's a sophomore at Louisiana State. We've been dating each other for a couple months now, and uh, we got married this morning in Mississippi. I'm pregnant. I didn't mean for it to happen. I, I went to Mama yesterday, and she said we better do this before we came to you. I'm sorry, Daddy. I know you wanted me to finish college, Carol. but... Jim's enjoying this. Mm. Oh, shh. Shh. It's all right, sweetheart. You did the right thing. That's what's important. Are you okay, Jim? What's going on over here? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris was, uh, well, I guess you saw Chris uh, was chasing a net. Were you successful in your pursuit? I feel like there's more than one. That's what I mean. And then I was watching him uh, through the monitor. Yeah, there's one right there. Okay, yeah, right we're here. being swarmed by nets. It's distracting as hell. As we do the show. And it's apparently just, well, also clapping into the mic is distracting the audience. But, you know. I, I don't care about them. I care about me and getting a fly up my nose. Okay, well. What was this scene about? Oh, oh she's pregnant, right? Yeah, yeah she's pregnant. And yeah. she got married that very morning to a gentleman called Bruce. Yeah. And Bruce and Carol, they win their own free house as a result of this. Yeah. Um, well, it's not free when there's strings attached, as we'll see later on. Yeah, well, they're kind of uh, under the, not spell, but under the aegis? Is that the word? Under the heel? Under the heel, better term, of uh, Len and his whims. Yeah. Um, yeah, his reaction here, though, Lens, was a bit surprising, no? Uh, yeah, based on... Uh, how he reacted the first one. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it's almost like uh, Carol seems to be the only family member he has any shred of respect for. Now, which one is that? Gwyneth Paltrow. Okay, yeah. Yeah, she did seem to be his favorite. If there's a daughter he thinks the least of, um, <laughs> it'd probably be his youngest. Yeah. Shirley Jr. Yeah. She didn't even get her own name. Right. Uh, and Shirley Jr. happens to be the daughter who stumbles upon this scene. Yeah. And this is where we find out that this isn't just a movie about a strict father. He's got a lot of other things going on. <laughs> he has a... It's okay, Brody. Uh, nothing's wrong. Uh, I want you to meet somebody. Uh, this here is uh, Marty Courtney. Now, she lives over on Walters Road, just a few blocks from here. And, well, she's going to be coming around the house helping me with yard work. Your father said you like horses. I like them, too. Maybe we can go riding sometime. Honey, uh, you know, your mother, <laughs> she might not understand what you saw here today. Uh, she might get real upset. She uh, might even decide to, uh, you know, leave home. And you know whose fault that would be? Well, <laughs> yours. Because you told her. That'd be your fault. And not mine. <laughs> what a horrible thing to say to a child. <laughs> That's awful. <laughs> it's really bad. <laughs> and Shirley Jr. does stay quiet. But it's revealed in a bit that Shirley Sr. knows about Marty. Marty was the girl <clears throat> we just saw Len making out with in an abandoned car. Yeah, she's a piece of work, too. <laughs> Not a surprise, given that the book was written by the daughters, that they wouldn't have a high opinion of uh, their dad's mistress. But, uh, <laughs> you know. Well, why, why should they? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, Shirley Sr. also knows about other women over the years that Len has made part of his life. Right. Let's join Carol as she is babysitting for Joanne and George. A Navy buddy of George shows up. Um, his name is Mike. There we go. Come here. Why are you 
<laughs> oh God! Shut up! Look at it was you. so that this baby crying was so crying long in this cars. movie. It felt like two Not minutes of that baby crying thing. before she <laughs> stuck that bottle in its mouth. Did you want to? Watch His father, my husband, <laughs> yeah. is in the service in Germany. Germany, is that right? Mm. I'm supposed to visit him next month. <laughs> oh, now look at your big old eyes. It's big and blue. Now where did you ever get such big, beautiful blue eyes? Yeah, he's not coming on to her. He's just dumb. Yeah. Or both. Possibly. So Len summons George to his home office. George is Matthew Perry, uh, the son-in-law. And uh, Len has a not-at-all suspicious proposal. Yeah. Now, this isn't Gwyneth Paltrow's husband. This is the older daughter's husband. Yeah. Yeah. LJ, Joanne said you wanted to see me before we left? Yes, George, yeah. Well, well, come on in here. <clears throat> George, um, I've been thinking. I'd like to buy you and Joanne a boat. A sailboat. Uh, something of decent size, 40 foot or so. You want to buy us a boat? Well, it'd be for the whole family. Uh, we go for outings on Lake Pontchartrain, but you'd hold the title. Now, you'd have to keep maintained. Now, you were in the Navy. You're good at that sort of work. Uh, what do you think? Well, I think that sounds terrific, sir. I'll go make some phone calls, get a good price for you right now. Good, good. Uh, George, George, before you go, um, I've got a paper I need your signature on. Um, add an extra coverage to your hospitalization for you, Joanne, and the kids. Oh, sure thing, LJ. Yeah. Right and listen, this is really nice of you about the boat. <laughs> That's real generous. Yeah, well. Well, that's what brings me pleasure, George. Doing things for my family. A boat? Could I be any more excited? <laughs> yeah, that doesn't seem suspicious at all, does no, it? No, no, no. And it's so devious and so tragic. Uh, George is way too naive to know, but he just signed on to star in the whole 10 yards. Oh, no. Savagery. Oh, savagery. Now, months go by, and Len asks George a favor. Remember what the favor is? I think it was like to work on the roof or fix the roof or something. Hang some floodlights around the barn. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, as it gets close to dinner time that night, uh, George is nowhere to be found. No, thanks, Len. Carol and I are to start at supper. Should be ready about six. I checked by the stables. He's not there. Well, Shirley said George didn't buy the stables. I can't imagine where else he might be. Okay. Daddy said check behind the stables on the hassle side of the property. She's uh she's going to look, Lynn. Uh -huh. Okay, we'll we'll see you about supper time. Bye. That's uh, Robert Urich that she's on the phone Shirley. right there. Right. Shirley! No, wait! Mama! At this point, I thought. You won't see him in this movie anymore anyway. Well, this doesn't spoil anything, but we never really find out what happens to Shirley Jr. in real life or in this story the way it's told. Yeah. Um, she's really racking up quite a, a total of emotional scars. I'd say so, yeah. And uh, w before this scene, uh, we saw Robert Urich's character rushing off to work, presumably after he just murdered that guy, to establish an alibi. And it was remarked that uh, he's going to work. He hasn't done that in months. So... Apparently, his, uh, his criticism of his uh, uh, son-in-laws, right, not having educations or real jobs or anything, uh, apparently he doesn't at this point anymore either, is what, is what we're being told. So. Right, right. Well, I think he had to take time off. Uh, he's, a, he's an attorney. Yeah. He had to take time off because he had a mild heart attack. He did have a heart attack. Yeah, that's true. But then he didn't go back to work, apparently, no. which we'll see plays into all this. Now, uh, late one night while uh, Len is asleep, Shirley Sr. dips into his office and has a quick look through his documents. Sure. And uh, the next day, she confronts him. I know about George. You took a policy out on him nine months before he died. 
double indemnity in case of accidental death with you as a sole beneficiary. For $200,000, you killed your own daughter's husband. You were the loser, a shiftless bum. Joanna's better off with Adam. <laughs> you left your own grandchildren without a father. How could I you? I took very good care of that family. Joanna's getting Social Security, VA, uh, survival benefits. George is making more dead than when he was alive. I want a divorce. I refuse to live with you any longer. Do you think I'm going to let some blood-sucking divorce lawyer snoop around on my personal affairs? Absolutely not. I will bury you first. Yeah, buddy, you just confessed to murder. Yeah. The attorneys you should be worried about are not of the divorce variety. Right. So, naturally, Shirley Sr. goes to the police. They wire her up. He confesses again and goes to prison for life, right? Hmm. I don't think that's what happens. No, of course not. She yeah. instead agrees to lend the man for uh, them not to divorce, but to merely separate. Yeah. So she moves out of the house. And uh, one astute commenter in the YouTube comments, uh, Jim, if you could bring up ashes. Uh, somebody had a concern about the condition of the house. Uh, anyone going to say anything about cigarette ashes that fall on the carpet? I smoke and not a time ashes don't fall down. <laughs> Why doesn't? He white gloved the carpet for ashes. <laughs> so, yeah, there's some concern <laughs> as a condition of the house. <laughs> it's a very astute viewer. <laughs> oh, man. <clears throat> so, yeah, um, Shirley Sr. and Len, they separate. And Marty, that's uh, Len's girlfriend we met earlier. Right. The, the gal in the abandoned car. Yeah, well, I thought she was a landscaper. Now you're telling me she's his mistress? Okay. <laughs> well, uh, she moves into the house with Lynn. Yeah. Carol's husband, Carol, again, Gwyneth Paltrow. Her husband, Bruce, is back from Germany. He's military. He was stationed over there. Yeah. Uh, and one day, Len asks Bruce to go hunting with him and Marty. When they arrive at the hunting ground, Len tells Bruce he should go off on his own because he, quote, doesn't like to be crowded. Mm-hmm. They'll meet back at the truck at noon. So uh, Bruce walks off nervously into the woods alone. And whatever you think happens next, you're wrong. wrong. so much blood he, he said it was an accident he said that he slipped on a bottle and his hand his his left hand is almost blown completely off they can't put back and the whole time he's he's talking about the insurance the police report his hands hanging by a single piece of skin and the only thing he can think about is the insurance now for the record this is insurance scam number two yes if you're keeping count yeah in two insurance scams thus far. Yeah. Sacrificing his own left hand. Yeah. Why did he need uh, Bruce to be uh, about for this? That's a good question. That seemed to be a setup for uh, the audience to expect something. I'm not sure that actually happened. If yeah. I would question one thing as being uh, a work of fiction, yeah, uh, I would guess it was this. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Put in there for uh, drama purposes. Yeah, yeah. Dramatic purposes, I mean. So soon after witnessing uh, the aftermath of this gruesome scene, Bruce did, um, Carol drops a bombshell on Bruce. Now, who's Carol? Carol is Gwyneth Paltrow. Okay. Did you watch the movie, Chris? I, I did, but... Or did you just collect YouTube comments? Well, I was doing both, so I didn't have time to learn the character <laughs> names. Okay, well, um, <laughs> for a while now, you remember early on, um, she was babysitting, and that guy complimented her on her eyes. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Carol... Gwyneth Paltrow has uh, been dating that guy. Yeah. She's still married to Bruce. While her husband was stationed in Germany, she was yeah. running around with that guy. Yeah. yeah. So she confesses to her husband that not only is she in love with Mike, 
but also that Mike and not Bruce is the real father of her daughter, Kimberly. Yeah. Sadly, no Maury Povich in, in this scene. No, that no, would have no. been great. Yes. It may not have seemed like it to him at the time, but um, for Bruce, this could be the best series of events that ever happened to uh, yeah. Bruce Applegarth. So, uh, speaking of surprises, here's one for Shirley Sr. This is her new home. Oh, you... the mistress, oh. And that's a rock to the head. Oh. He's oh. mine now! You let him go! You give him a divorce! Oh. Carol, Nancy, he doesn't... Yeah. So Len has led Marty to believe that Shirley Sr. is the one not agreeing to the divorce. So the police arrive because in this family, although murder may lead to a shuffling around of who lives where, aggravated assault, on the other hand, calls for the intervention of law enforcement. Oh, okay. They finally crossed the line? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Len shows up at the scene and makes a deal with Shirley Sr. He'll grant her a divorce if she doesn't press assault charges against Marty. What about those divorce lawyers she was worried about? Nah, uh, Seemed like it'd be easier to deal, so, with, deal with a simple assault charge. But. Not so worried anymore. Yeah. None of this makes any sense. But yeah, I mean, we were right to question this guy's decision-making, <laughs> I think. <laughs> so soon after, Carol and Mike, the man she fell in love with while married to Bruce, Carol again, Gwyneth Paltrow. Oh, okay. Uh, they get married, and Len reveals what his wedding gift is for the newlyweds. I bought you a special present. You did? What? A life insurance policy. I'll keep it at my house. Make all the payments. You got me an insurance policy? For, no, not you, for money. Now, you kids just don't think about those sort of things, but that, that's what a father's for, to look after your future. I just want to make sure, no matter what happens... Girl, always be okay. Yeah. Well, wow. how thoughtful. It should be noted that Len is also having unexpected financial problems. The payout for blowing his hand off is not coming through. Yeah. And the insurance company claimed it wasn't an accident. Meanwhile, Mike and Carol, they're also hitting hard times. Carol proposes to the family her idea for a novel way to manufacture candles. But everybody just agrees to pretend they didn't hear that. <laughs> Mike has a more profitable idea. Here he makes his return from a business trip. Well, it's good to have you home. You know, I got a visit the other night from Daddy. Oh, well, isn't this great? Hi, honey. How was your trip? Are you tired? Everything go all right? I'm sorry. Yeah. What happened? Did something go wrong? Yeah, almost. Yeah, almost. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't this mean to This is my favorite scene. What's with your old man? What'd he step into now? The insurance company won't pay for his hand. What the hell are we supposed to do about that? Well, um... I thought that, you know, since we seem to be doing so well financially that... Maybe we could lend him a few thousand dollars until he gets this thing straightened out. A few thousand dollars? Oh, sure, just hand it over to him. Yeah. Oh, this is great, Carol. I go down to Mexico every month buying weed so that... What? What the hell did you... You told me you were down there buying jewelry. I told you that, Carol, because that's what you wanted to hear. <laughs> oh, I envy you. Oh, I really do. That's an incredible talent you have, seeing only what you want to see. This guy reminds me of uh, the neighbor in office space. Right. That, Watch your cornhole, buddy. <laughs> he reminds me of that guy. So um, Carol gives Len the money. Oh, no? She does? Yeah, she does. And uh, she also lets him know where the money came from. Let's see this. Okay. What do you want? What are you doing here? Well, the other night you told me that you were in trouble. I thought this might help you. Where'd you get this money? Mike got it. How? He's been smuggling dope from Mexico. 
You got this selling dope? Yes. Uh oh. I don't want this money. But Daddy, you told I'm me. I'm going in. Oh. What? Whatever Mike's doing, I want to be part of it. We could be partners. He can make some runs for me. If Mike knew that I told you, he would have my head. I'm broke. This is a way out for me. No, I can't do it. Yes, you can. He loves you. You could talk him into it. Daddy, you are asking me too much. Too much? How can I ask you too much? After everything I've given you, I gave you life. Yeah. This was the same guy who, in the beginning of the movie, was concerned that his daughters weren't marrying uh, professional college-educated people. Or potentially wearing miniskirts. Yeah. And now he wants in on their drug smuggling operations. You know, you know why he doesn't want them wearing miniskirts? Because miniskirts are taking all the mystery out of parties. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is definitely not the guy you want to... <laughs> Cut in on your drug smuggling operation. <laughs> right. So uh, I, this has gotten really heavy lately. The clips we're watching now are get, getting heavier and heavier. There's been murder. There's been insurance scams. Let's, uh, let's see something a little bit lighter. Um, in the upload of the film we watched, you probably noticed this, Chris. The commercials are removed. Yeah. But the audio of the first commercial bleeds into the first scene back from break. Yeah. And it leads to this piece of serendipity. Hey, girls, do this. That's right, girls. Shoot your brother in the head. <laughs> Just like Grandpa showed you. <laughs> All right, um, back to the movie. So Mike goes on another drug run. This time, Carol insists on going with him. They get robbed by the federales on the way back. Yeah. And they lose the drugs and all their money, including the money Len invested with them. Invested, sure. That's what you could call it. Well, when he learns of this, Len, of course, is he, it's safe to say he was not best pleased. Right. Let's see. Even give a damn? I want my money. Every cent of it. I'm warning you. You're warning me? Who the hell do you think you're talking to? One of your fawning little daughters? You beg me to make this run for you, man. I put my ass on the line for you. I owe you nothing, old man. Do you understand that? Nothing. Wife, you explain to him why it'd be better if he uh, gave him my money. You explain what could happen if he doesn't. In, in Len's defense, his uh, his polished budget has gone off. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone through the roof lately. <laughs> Went from zero to what thirty thousand. <laughs> I'm I'm spending a fortune on Brasso every month. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, to eliminate the potential for a repeat incident, Carol then proposes a novel way of growing her own marijuana, but everybody just agrees to pretend they didn't hear that. So Mike and Carol separate. Len reaches out to Mike and says he's willing to put the whole robbed in Mexico incident behind him. He wants to rejoin Mike in the smuggling business. Now, Carol warns her uh, estranged, hu estranged husband that her father is dangerous. Yeah. She tells him not to go through with the meeting. Yeah. But Mike shows up anyway. She, she flat out tells him he will kill you. Yes. And whatever you think happens next, you're right. But we're not going to see that because all that happens off camera. Right. Shortly after, Len meets with Carol. What'd you do? I killed him, baby. I plugged him right through the heart. I waited for my outside. I called him over here and I pulled a gun on him. I meant for him to drive to the mall. I wanted to shoot him there to make it look like a robbery. He grabbed for my gun, so I shot him. His foot stuck down on accelerator. Crashed us into a tree. Hit my head. Thank God I didn't get knocked out. I ran on home and Marty helped me clean myself up. Well, don't look at me like that. I did it for you. You told me how he was drinking, how he hit you. You did it all, didn't you? You killed George. You did that to your hand. You did everything. It's a matter of survival. I'll do whatever I have to do. Yeah, so Len confesses to murder and insurance fraud again. Yeah, this is number three, if you're still keeping score. 
Well, Carol does what anyone could have done this whole time since George died. Right. She goes to the police. Somebody finally does the right thing. Right. Now, uh, when she goes to the police, she talks to a detective. And, Chris, you notice something about this guy. Let's take a look. Yeah. I'll have to watch closely to see him. Okay, Miss Holland. Uh, this is your statement saying that Leonard John Fago confessed to you the deliberate killing of your husband, Mike Holland. And one more thing, uh, if after making this statement, you feel right, you have wanna... reason to fear for your life. There it is. Yeah, that's as close as we're going to get. Um, I believe that is a lit cigarette behind his yes. ear. <laughs> it appears to be a lit cigarette. <laughs> yeah. Sign right here. No, I do this occasionally myself, Steve. I tuck one in between my ear and my head, you know, for later. Uh, but unlit. Yeah, unlit. Yeah, for safekeeping. Right. I've never put a lit cigarette hit? next to my head. Mm. <laughs> you know what I think this is, Chris? I don't think this was to be noticed in such detail. Right. I think it's a prop cigarette that's supposed to look like it's lit. Yeah, of course. One that someone would be. Uh, but no one realized that wouldn't make sense if the actor's just going to put it behind his ear. Yeah. I guess people, people didn't have great TVs back in 1993. Yeah. So a lot of things like this weren't noticed. But, uh, you know, there you are. So Len is put on trial for the murder of Mike Holland. Who's that? Uh, Carol's oh. estranged husband. Yeah. Gwyneth Paltrow's first husband. No, second husband. E- yes. Bruce you're right. Bruce was her first husband. Yeah. Mike was her second husband. He's the, uh, the office space guy. Yeah. Okay. I got confused because Mike Holland is the guy I went to high school with. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So you naturally assumed he was Gwyneth Paltrow's first husband. Sure. <clears throat> oh, well, uh, Len is found guilty for the murder, and uh, let's take a look at the immediate aftermath. That was the last time I saw my father. He was sentenced to 40 years of hard labor without the benefit of probation, parole, or suspension of sentence. Marty was charged as an accessory after the fact. Her trial would be next. Daddy was released on bond pending an appeal. Okay. We all knew he'd never go to jail. Yeah, sentenced to 40 years of hard labor. Yeah, I don't think that's a thing. What would that be for this guy? <clears throat> Juggling? <laughs> Rubbing his belly and patting his head? <laughs> Designated hitter? <laughs> Yeah, as you just heard uh, Gwyneth say, Len was released on bond pending an appeal, but he committed suicide in the interim. Well, not not only insurance uh, suicide, but it was uh, he tried to make it look like murder. Yeah. So that is number four. Number four insurance scam. And uh, now we can say uh, he went one for four on those. <laughs> only the first one worked. So, uh Yeah. Pretty pretty bad at it, actually. Yeah, not good at all. Yeah, not good at all. I mean, you got to figure, once you cash in the first time, the insurance company's going to be on to you. They're going to be looking at you. Yeah. But uh, that didn't stop him. They didn't even say, well, who would blow their own hand off for $200,000 or whatever it was? Well, the thing is, is he had a shotgun. Like, I can see that with a handgun. But how how do you shoot your own hand off with a shotgun? Like, what are you doing with it? Again, juggling, like you said. It really doesn't make any sense. But I guess if he should have taken a revolver with him, it would have made a lot more sense. But it's supposed to be a hunting accident. Who hunts with a revolver? I think you can hunt. They were hunting rabbits. People hunt rabbits with a with a pistol. Okay, I didn't know that. I think. All right, maybe. Maybe they do. I have to assume everything you say is true now because uh, I was taken to school on friends' history. Yeah. When was I hard on you, Chris? I don't remember. No, oh, we'll see. It, obviously, I remember it happened, but I don't, I don't remember what you were discussing. Okay. But it happened. It happened, but. Not no hard feelings, wound, Steve. No hard feelings. Called, called to mind. Do we, do we want to. Uh, another incident occurs. Yeah. Do we, do we want to m- throw in something lighthearted? We can look at another comment. Oh, yeah, let's do that. All right, let's bring up DVD. Now, this person said, uh, they love this movie. They love it so much that they watched it a thousand times. 
which I find maybe that's a bit of hyperbole. Sure. But, uh, <laughs> however, they're so glad that it's, they're now able to stream this movie because uh, <laughs> they can watch it at a moment's notice without having to load up a whole DVD. <laughs> so there you go, Steve. We, the contingent that finds DVDs too hard to operate too difficult. has uh, been Julian heard from. <laughs> yeah. Thank God it's streaming now. I don't have to uh, push that button that opens the lid. <laughs> I figure if you watch it a thousand times, it's probably always in the DVD player. <laughs> you don't even have to like look for it or anything. <laughs> All right. All right. <clears throat> Do we want to see more comments? Do we have any more comments? Uh, they're mostly about the end, so I think we, we want to end the movie, I think, at this point. Well, uh, that's all I have as far as clips go. Okay, well, the end scene is the same as the beginning scene. It's, a few, it's the father's funeral. Right. And um, the... The ending narration by Gwyneth Paltrow is uh, she had a dream, and uh, something happened in that dream. Jim, if you could bring up uh, a doctor. This is the quote Gwyneth Paltrow makes about the dream. This is what her father says in her dream. You're mistaken. I have no daughters. And he says, good. You ladies are better off without a father like that. Indeed, he was a father, but... No more. And somebody says, well, he never, he never said that he was dead. <laughs> so this guy who claims to be a doctor <laughs> uh, apparently didn't understand the end of the movie. So, uh, uh, wow. Are you saying he's, he's fudged his resume? Yeah. <laughs> or at the very least, his username? I think he might be a doctor like uh, Dr. Teeth of the, uh, <laughs> the Muppet Band. <laughs> <clears throat> you have more of these, right? Uh, well, this this movie that we watched was thankfully uploaded by uh, you know somebody who likes these types of things and uploaded a lot of stuff. And uh, they go by the YouTube username of Stacy Keach, the well-known actor. Right. So, uh, Jim, if you could bring up Keach One there. You only have two. You don't have Keach One. There's a Keach one. We have Keach one. We I mean, it's Keech just Keach. It's not Keach one, but refers to uh, Stacy Keach, the legendary actor. I believe he played Mike Hammer in a lot of TV movies. Yeah, that was, I, I think, a TV show. Was it just a series of mini? Uh, I think it was movies? a series of um, TV movies. Oh, there were so many. I thought it was an actual show. But yeah, they say this person, Yolanda Jones, says, uh, "Mr. Keach, you are one of my favorite actors. Thanks for taking the time <laughs> to read and comment on my post." Glad some are post. Glad you know whatever she's thanking him, but um, she's under the impression that this is Stacy Keach. But if you Jim, if you could bring up Keach too, we'll see who actually uploaded this movie, and it's it's a guy named Colin from England, um, which is information accessible to anyone. But apparently, Yolanda Jones, she really thought she was talking to Stacy Keach. Can you? Uh, she probably <laughs> talking to her friends. You know who I talked to the other day. Stacy Keach. <laughs> Remember him? He played Mike Hammer. Two things, Chris, people don't have time for. Clicking on the username or uh, pressing play on a DVD player. Right. Yeah. Strangely, they have time to make all these comments. Plenty of time. Yeah. So uh, before we rate the movie, I have two more. Um, you know, I've commented before about... Uh, some of the movies you watch are god awful, yeah. And yet, there's no negative comments at all, which leads me to believe that somebody's going in there and deleting them. Yeah. I don't know, but uh, that's not the case. Even though, I mean, I'm just going to say, come out and say it. I I enjoyed this movie a lot more than most of the other things we watch. But uh, Jim, you can bring up the two bad movie uh, things. There, there's a lot of people. You know, the acting is wooden. The script is predictable. Uh, you know, this guy really didn't like it. And he makes something about assorted biscuits. I don't even know what that is. But uh, he would rather watch paint dry. And uh, there's another one there. You know, it's just a lot of I, a lot of people didn't like it. Mm -hmm. Terrible. That's what one person says. Trash waste, movie. Waste of time. This movie really sucks. Stupid film. Yeah. Yeah. 
I just thought it was notable because I, I we searched high and low for negative comments before. I even tried to leave one. No, did I? I think I tried. <laughs> I tried no, to leave. I, I think, think I tried, tried to leave one on our show. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I, uh, I, I think I tried to leave a humorous comment actually, but um, I wasn't able to comment on the one movie. I don't know why. Um, but uh, yeah, so there you go. Some negative comments did make it through. Well, uh, so are you ready to rate this one? Sure. Okay. And uh, our scale is one to five Meredith Baxter's. Yes. Um, I, I'm going to give it a four. Cause I wow. Uh, at first, I thought it was going to be awful, and then once you realize it's all about how out of control this guy is, it's kind of fun. It's a real roller coaster ride. I mean, I feel bad that it's a true story that this actually happened to a family, but yeah, you know. at the core of it is uh, brutality. Yeah, so that part's sad, but uh, it's an enjoyable thing to watch. Right, uh, I give it three out of five. Meredith okay. Baxter's. I'm not familiar with the source material or uh, the real-life events that are depicted, but when telling a true story like this, it's easy for some filmmakers to uh, bog down the process with a lot of unnecessary detail just to tell the complete story. Uh, in this case, every scene has a purpose. Yeah. Every scene moves the story forward, and I found it entertaining. I'm not going five out of five simply because it fails to feature Mayor Winningham getting a brain transplant, mm. which is a standard by which all films, whether made for the smaller big screen, should be held to. Yeah. Chris, there's something else you wanted to talk about tonight. There is. Uh, you know, I, I, I commented on the uh, Kanye West saga. And brilliantly, might I say. Well, I don't know. But uh, I did comment. And uh, it's not something, it, it had a personal, it hit me in a personal place. Right. And that's the only reason I did it. Uh, something else has come up in the news. And this, this hasn't, I have no horse in this race at all. <laughs> all right. um, but nevertheless, I, I feel like I'm going to comment again, even though I probably shouldn't. I probably should keep my mouth shut. Um, but what the hell? Why not? Go for it. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this story, Steve, but there was uh, a WNBA player who was playing over in Russia because it's, I don't know when the WNBA season is, but apparently it's not now. So she was over playing in Russia during the off season to make some money. Um, so that's like an alternate league uh, she can play in to uh, supplement her income. Yeah. Um, and I'm familiar with, uh, there's a Russian hockey league and a lot of Canadians and Americans go over there and play either at the end of their career or, you know, if they're just shuffled out of the NHL. Um, so I'm familiar with this sort of thing, and it, I didn't think anything unusual about it. But uh, then she got arrested for uh, having marijuana vapes and uh, in Russia. And this was right at the beginning of the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. Or Ukraine. And uh, um, was that it? What? Was that what you were pissed at me for? Pointing no. out that you were saying the Ukraine versus No, Ukraine. Like, you have to go back and watch it. We, we had a couple disagreements in the last few weeks. There's nothing to worry about, dude. Um, but so she got arrested, right, for dr I don't possession, drug possession. Okay. Right? And um, the situation in Ukraine is complicating things because, I mean, you saw Midnight Express, right? I haven't, but I'm familiar enough with it. it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like there, so normally the, Embassy, the American embassy would be trying to get her out of there. Because in America, having marijuana vapes is no big deal. Yeah, if they find you with some and you don't have enough, they give you more. Yeah. Not the same in Russia, though. They, they take a dimmer view of that sort of activity. So normally the embassy, the consul, I don't know, whatever, would try, would be involved. But because of the situation going on, uh, it's complicated, to say the least. Um, all that's understandable. Um, and this has been going on for weeks now. What bothers me is I'm seeing coverage of this has all of a sudden been turned into this is only happening to her because she's a lesbian, and this is only happening to her because she's a woman. Either one of those things. And what particularly has come up is she's only there, she only had to go to Russia because the WNBA stars don't get paid what the NBA stars get paid. And that's the real issue here, Steve, is gender pay inequality.
That I swear, Google this, you will see all the news stories. Do we have to explain this? Do people not understand why that is just the utmost of malarkey? I believe everyone knows. <laughs> Here's something that CNN posted today. Okay. All right. The vast salary gap between NBA and WNBA. Uh, by the way, shall we say that the NBA, forget the Premier League, forget the NFL, the NBA is the only global sports league. Yeah, and I'm pointing this way because there's a screen in front of us. That right. probably looks really weird on camera <clears throat> that I'm pointing off into the distance. But um, well, Chris is just uh, showing me where to look. Yeah, but this because I, I was stunned when I heard the angle people are taking on. Now I highlighted something here, Steve. It yeah. says uh, I can't read it. Maybe you can from here. The NBA, uh, the the NBA minimal minimum player salary is more than. Quadruple, quadruple that of the WNBA, and and I'm, and I'm sure so is the revenue. From and, the NBA. and well, I'll get to that, Steve. Okay. But they're kind enough to give us the the minimum and maximum minimum and maximum salaries here for us to compare. And they say more than quadruple. Now, the minimum salary in the NBA is what does it say there, Steve? Uh, fifty-eight thousand seven hundred ten dollars. That's the WNBA. WNBA fifty-eight thousand, and the NBA on the other side there nine hundred twenty-five thousand. Now. By my math, that's 15 times. So they are not incorrect by saying quad, more than quadruple. <laughs> yes, 15 <laughs> is actually more than four. So thank you, CNN, for uh, the insightful commentary. Now, Steve, obviously what they meant was that the WNBA minimum salary of it's 200-something, you can see on the screen, uh, is quad, more than quadruple the NBA minimum. So they're comparing the WNBA maximum, the maximum to the with the NBA minimum, but that's not what they said. And this sloppiness is indicative of the whole reporting of this freaking situation, and that's what I'm fed up about. It's sloppy reporting. If you really wanted to compare these things, as Steve said, you look at the salary as a percentage of the revenue that the league brings in. That's the only way to compare this. That's how salary caps are calculated. They figure out how much revenue the league made the year before. They take the percentage that's agreed to in the collective bargaining agreement, and that's how you calculate the salary cap, and that's what everyone's salaries are based on. This comparison is ludicrous. It's meaningless. And, and it's divisive and, and, and unnecessarily. Everyone, as you said, everyone knows this. We're pointing out the obvious. Right, right. Why are they reporting it to us? Why don't they show us the revenue figures Report on that, and then, oh, the, the, the NBA pays the players 70% of league revenue. The WNBA only pays 40%. That would be real gender pay inequality. That would be the conversation to have here. The fact that they're obscuring it, I'm led to believe there is no gender pay inequality here. Otherwise, why wouldn't they lay the facts out for us? Right. Well, see, the problem is if they reported it accurately or uh, with, um, with sensitivity toward the numbers, understanding that numbers don't lie. Right. Uh, if they did it that way, there would be no victim. Yeah. There needs to be a victim for yeah. this to be a story. Yeah, exactly. That's what this is. That's all I have to say. Well, I'm, I'm glad you said that because uh, I knew nothing about this, but this is, this is insanity. And you see this sort of thing all the time. People talk about uh, the differences between uh, pay, and uh, a lot of times there are factors that are not brought into the story at all, relevant factors. I mean, I don't know who wouldn't, as you said, why, do we even need to explain this? It's so freaking odd. Anyone with half a brain can see the difference here. Uh, I, I, you know, yeah, I, I guess that's it for the uh, EIB network here. I'm checking out. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that case, is there anything you'd like to talk about that you haven't talked about? Uh, I played miniature golf on Wednesday, and I got a hole-in-one, which keeps my streak going. Nice. So. You get a hole-in-one every time? Every time I play that course, yeah. Oh. It's a great course out in Temple, Pennsylvania, where I grew up. So you've mastered the course. Shells. It's called Shells. Um, it's a, yes, but it's honestly, I play miniature golf with my daughter a lot, and uh, ne this is a course I grew up playing, and I've never found a better one. It's beautiful, beautifully landscaped, beautifully laid out. and uh, Now, you get a hole-in-one every time. Is it the same hole? No, different hole. Oh. Yeah. And I keep the scorecards to keep track. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thanks so much, Chris. Well, we hope you enjoyed this week's program. We hope you enjoyed uh, Deadly Relations. Mm. Uh, we don't have a movie picked out for next week, but uh, we will very soon. Yeah.
I know there's something you were looking at that uh, we'll get together with yeah. afterward. Um, hey, thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Do everything you have to do to help the algorithm because really, I mean, come on. We need help. Yeah. And what else is going on out there? <laughs> have you seen, Have you gotten a load of the other things that are, <laughs> that are going on? <laughs> oh, man. Okay. <clears throat> In that case, um, for Chris Morgani. I'm the bull of American broadcast. Oh, wait, wait. I'm sorry. I, I can't believe this came up t- two weeks in a row where we almost uh, snooed over the uh, the mayoral election. Do we want to do a separate uh, so sue me well, after we the do, show? We can do just a very quick um, recap of the election. Okay. If you watched, uh, there is a, a, a kind of a addendum, not addendum, an attache, perhaps, you might want to call it. Extra content, I believe they call Extra it. Extra content. Well, there we go. See, I, I'm, you're in this universe. You're in this <laughs> world. You're steeped in the YouTube universe. <laughs> yeah, sure. <clears throat> uh, yeah, we did a show called uh, So Sue Me, episode one. More to come. Uh, we're not going to do one of those uh, this time, uh, but another one will come up subsequently. Uh, the mayoral election occurred last Tuesday. And there is no need for a runoff. See, ordinarily what happens is a bunch of people run for mayor. Right. Say uh, five, six, seven, 32. It doesn't even matter. Right. Because uh, there's no primary. It's a nonpartisan seat. So anybody can run as long as you get the signatures. And there's an election. But the election determines the top two candidates. And those people typically meet in a runoff weeks later. Right. So uh, the election serves as a quasi-primary. Unless one of the candidates gets 50% of the vote or more, in which case that person is elected mayor. And Paul Tenhaken did indeed get 70-some percent of the vote. Oh, okay. 21,842 votes for Mr. Tenhaken. Uh, Tanisa Islam got the second greatest number at 7,344. And our friend, David Zokaitis, 574 votes. Hmm. Now, Steve, I'm getting a text from CNN. They're telling me that uh, Ten Haken actually got more than quadruple the votes that David Z got. <laughs> so thank you, CNN, again, for your insightful commentary. So uh, congratulations uh, to uh, the incumbent and new, as well, Mayor uh, Paul Ten Haken, uh, the, the guy I endorsed this time. First time I picked a winner. In this Who Falls May or All right. Well, so. there you go. Now your endorsement will mean something in the future. Right, right, right. <clears throat> well, in that case, uh, thanks again. Chris Morgani, the bull. Oski Wiwi. Oski Wawa. Tigers. Eat them raw. We did it, Seth. Uh,